Hello and welcome to Story with Linda. My guest today, Sa'amala, is an award-winning poet, writer, children's author, journalist, translator, and interdisciplinary scholar. He writes fluently in, in English and French, and sometimes in his indigenous language, Bessa. And Sa'amala began writing plays in the second grade in secondary school, the then GSS Mbessa, and since then, he has published five volumes of poetry, four in English and one in French, and two children's books in English and French. Welcome to Story with Linda and Sa. How are you? I'm doing fine, Linda. Thank you. And thanks for having me. I hope you're doing fine, too. Yes, I am. Thank you so much for making the time. So let's start with the basics. Um, as a writer, you have a pen name. You use a pen name. For those who don't know what a pen name is, what is it and how did you pick yours? All right, thank you. That's a, a very interesting way to start off. You know, my pen name is Sa'amala, and, um, but it's both a pen name and also not a pen name. So I'm going to bring, to explain because generally quite often pen names have nothing in common with the person's legal name. But my pen name happens to have part of my legal name. Mm -hmm. which is Sa. Uh, so, uh, but before I come into this, uh, the explaining um, the, the, the composition of this pen name, I should say what a pen name is. A pen name is generally another name, which is other than a person's legal name that a person chooses, usually artists like writers, like musicians. Mm -hmm. With musicians, it's often called a stage name. Mm -hmm. uh, and for writers, it's often called a pen name or a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. which means another name that someone adopts to use in publishing their books for one reason or the other. And the reasons are often quite varied as, as varied as the people who do that. Mm -hmm. While some people prefer to go along with their legal names in publishing things. So in my case, my pen name is Samala, and that is actually my father's name plus my grandfather's name. And my father was called Nsa Amala. Mm -hmm. Nsa is my legal surname, my legal family name and my father was Nsa and my grandfather was Mala so choosing that name for me uh, first of all is because that's quite African but most importantly that's also a way for me to pay tribute to uh, my paternity to my father and to my grandfather so to my paternal lineage and of course also because I thought uh, as a writer I suppose that maybe one day my writings might circulate more largely around the world than the other things that I do. Mm -hmm. And I would like to circulate around the world with my very African Mesa identity mm -hmm. than anything that has colonial uh, connotations. Nice. Um, I love that, that you had that dream for yourself, that your 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 work may become popular someday. It's, it's important to have big dreams. Um, <laughs> what you. caught my attention, actually, why I asked you to be on my show is your book entitled Andolo, the Talented Boy with Albinism. Why is that topic, the topic of albinism, of interest to you? Yeah, al albinism uh, is important uh, in, the, in the book Andolo, the, the boy uh, with uh, the talented boy with albinism. But I should uh, specify that it is actually um, both about talent and albinism. So, because as you can see in the title of the book already, we have talent and we have albinism. And I was trying to do two things. I was trying to pay tribute to uh, many of my family relations mm -hmm. and other people from my community who live with albinism, but also to celebrate some of them who have distinguished themselves uh, in extraordinary ways with their talents. Mm -hmm. And I thought that even if they didn't live with albinism, their talent alone would have been sufficient for me to uh, to to bring it to the mm. to, to the world. So you see, so so I was doing two things. You know that the, the the proverb of taking one stone and shooting two birds, and so also coincidentally, therefore, we as we we all come from Africa, we all have African roots, and albinism is a. a a challenging issue, uh, mm -hmm. also a, a sensitive issue because, especially when we talk about the African continent, because we're talking about people who in some parts of the African continent, simply because they have albinism, which is none of their fault, are persecuted, are sometimes killed uh, for rituals and terrible things are happening. And so we all have to put our hands on deck to protect these people. Mm 
yes. uh, who are just as normal as you and me, except for the absence of melanin, that is none of their fault. Yes. So I thought, yeah, why, why not do this? And also, I should say something because there, like, there is a panoply of reasons why I wrote this book. I've already given you the reason about the talent. Mm-hmm. And I had an uncle who was also super talented and he had albinism. Then there is Andolo, a, a stepbrother of mine in the external royal family. And my uncle too was also in the extended royal family. Even in my closest family, I have a stepsister with two kids who have albinism. Mm-hmm. So and then I have aunt and aunt who, who has albinism. And again, one of the things I've tried to insist each time I do an interview about this book is that while in some parts of Africa, especially around East and Southern Africa, around Tanzania, around Kenya, we often hear very horrible, terrible stories mm-hmm. of what people go through, people who live with albinism. I'm not trying to say that we sometimes, but quite rarely hear those kind of stories in certain parts of Cameroon, but not all. But I was very interested in the fact that I, in my community, we rather have very much, very positive myths about albinism. Mm-hmm. So yeah, because it's like my white person. Yeah, so the first thing is like, yeah, believe that they're a white person, but one, the, the very special, unique one is that in my community, in Bersa, where I come from, in the kingdom of Bersa, we believe that albinism is a royal thing. That is like, because about 90% of people who live with albinism in my community are connected to the royal family. Oh, and so we believe wow. that they are, like, albinism belongs to the royal family. You know what? So, and then I would say, I would say, this is something I need to tell the world, that even when some other communities are doing terrible things, yeah, to people with albinism, why not let the world also know that about this positive image, this pos- yes. positive belief? So it's, it's a myth, but I think it's a positive myth that rather contributes to protecting, to 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 to, to, to valorizing people who live with albinism, because that is it. That's how we really believe that albinism, people with albinism are born into the royal family. Royal family. Yeah, that's and, so interesting. I love it. And actually, we have, even statistically, that seems to be very true, because I think as far as I know most, if not all, people with albinism in my community are connected to the royal family. Wow, yeah. so interesting. So you've just mentioned that that the book you wrote, um, you know, was mirrored after several people in your life, and I'm just curious what their reactions have been since this book has come out. Yeah, mm, difficult one, but I should say that the, the person. <clears throat> who is directly mentioned in this book, right from the title across the pages of the book to the very end, uh, who, are, who, is, who has been aware and uh, with whom I've been in touch recently and during the writing process to the publishing mm-hmm. is Andolo. Uh, that is, uh, Andolo is, is one of his numerous uh, um, uh, names. Yeah, nicknames, yeah, because we also have this culture of where we give a lot of nicknames to people. Yes. So Andolo, which I use, is actually the, the name for one of my stepbrothers from the royal family, whose real name is uh, Bruno B. And um, so I've been in touch with him after this, and he, I sent copies. He's very excited about the book. He's so happy about the book. I The, the, the last time I, I sent somebody to go get uh, the copy from his home and to have a read, I, I was told that when the person arrived, he wasn't at home, and his wife said, where he keeps the book, nobody can touch it. So which means that he keeps the book in a very special place that nobody can touch it at all. <laughs> So that, that's just to tell you how he values it. And, yeah. and I'm so happy for him because that's somebody. And also, if you so, so, some people might want to, uh, when, when they have the time to check on my YouTube channel, they might find some videos where he's actually playing drums or, or other musical instruments, just as I actually described in this book. So he's he lives in Yaoundé. And okay. I really do hope that if I were around, uh, I would like to maybe take, uh, to, to go along with him, maybe to some interviews on TV and elsewhere. So that, yeah, so that people get to know more of him because he is super super talented wow i love that the importance of telling our stories Um, (laughs) so i want to turn to another book um that that you have um you have a a book entitled a a poetry collection entitled and an audience forgive me he will probably correct me um constimocracy Mal Africanizing democracy. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you almost got it completely. Almost so that correctly. Bravo, because it's quite difficult. Yeah. This is the Constimo point. crazy. Constimo okay. crazy. Constimo crazy. Constimo crazy. Mal yes, Africanizing democracy. Democracy. 
See, yes. listeners, you're learning everything on this show, okay? <laughs> so can, can you explain to us what that concept is? Because those, those are big words. Yeah, because democracy is a poetic and a philosophical coinage of mine. That, that is, I mean, that's a neologism. A neologism is a new word that I've created poetically, but also philosophically to um, express uh, a, a rising and very alarming and worrying situation within uh, the African uh, governance space. Uh, I don't want to say democratic spacing, so I'm already talking about constimocracy. And by that, I mean so many things, but I will try to give just one or two of them. One of those things is the alarming and increasing rate at which some African presidents decide to modify constitutions to stay yes. in power. Yes. So, so that is so you see, consti, consti. So it is some kind of like constitutional modification, not democracy. Correct. Oh. So it's a kind of a democracy that is. I mean, it's a serious matter he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, we are laughing about it, but it's something very serious. It's a very People, serious yeah, issue. Yeah. 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 So and this because this is making Africa regress. Uh, this a huge continent, a blessed continent, a rich continent mm -hmm. that we are all proud of uh, coming from. But recently, there has been a lot of uh, regression on, on uh, world rankings in terms of democracy and transparency or, or with regard to corruption and all of these things explain it. So I decided to write this book, therefore, to, to, to ring a bell or some kind of poetic bell on this issue and to say this, I think this is not the right way to go about, like many people, including the people like uh, Ibrahim, uh, Mo Ibrahim of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, who yeah. is doing great to uh, great work to, <clears throat> to promote democracy on the continent, or people like uh, Dr. Christopher Formenue. So I think uh, I, I might be trying to add my little voice to their very voluminous voices in this mm -hmm. in this field <laughs> by highlighting these chronic modifications of constitutions by people to stay in power. Mm -hmm. And let me just add a few words there before we go. We know of countries like even ours, both of you, you and me, we are originally from Cameroon in one way or the other. And you know that people are dying in Cameroon, especially in Anglophone Cameroon, for a problem that can be solved with a simple modification of the constitution. But that is not being done. Yes. But if it is an individual that wants to stay, that is quickly and easily done. That is done as fast as a twinkle of an eye. Mm -hmm. so, so these are the kinds of issues that I had in mind. But if by then the, the war was not had not yet started, but I was looking at the situation of our country, other countries around us, especially in the Central African region, but elsewhere in other parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, something had to be done. At least let somebody express this. So I say, let me coin the word constimocracy. Constimocracy. So now, now I actually can say it easily because it makes sense in my head. Constimocracy. Um, changing of the constitution to, to stay to in power. power so as long as one wants yeah yeah it's definitely happening in many many countries including many Africa, countries yeah cameroon so it's um, not only I, a cameroonian thing yeah yeah it's not um mm -hmm. i would like to read one of the the poems um in in this uh poetry collection and it's called to ex-grandma on her divorce um i found it very intriguing so i wanted to read it and i want you to tell us uh, who the ex-grandma is and, and what message you're trying to send to her or to them. Um, to ex-grandma on her divorce. Dear ex-grandma, our spring of sentiments got dried after your divorce. You are break away from your sister wives without force recently. Freedom is good, but not but no excess. You see, you swooped down on us as a mom beyond the sea many years ago and tortured us with an iron hand, desecrating and confiscating our ancestral land. You auctioned us to our sisters in a bubbling union of servitude, sweating for sisters without our opinion. We are now orphans, washing our sisters' dirty dishes and gun pointed each time we say they take us for fishes. Our sisters have turned us into their kids, you know? The union you loathe now wasn't forced on you, we know. But you deceived us into an incestuous, barren relation. And on your divorce, you expect us to say congratulations? No, no way. Except you promise to unclaw us, from, to unclaw us from ours. No, no way. Except we are freed from this prison within hours. By the way, 
you've left a large free compound to be alone, but we need our freedom to cooperate, not to stand alone. Many neighbors fear you will soon catch colds and crumble, but all we want is our own freedom. Don't make us grumble. Thanks in advance for contacting your sister sellers to free us. Otherwise, coldest regard, your forced ex-children. I can really see from your reading that you liked that point. I did. <laughs> yeah. so who is who is ex-grandma and what is this message you're sending to ex-grandma? This is a difficult point. And I want to, I should start off by saying that as you very, very well know, uh, writers uh, like me, we, uh, there is a big difference between what we write and what we think. So it might not actually be me sending any message to anybody okay. because we can write from the perspectives of many different people and especially in poetry, even in fiction. Uh, yes. One thing that is good about writing is that writing permits us to imagine what others would say and, and say in their place. Which, mm -hmm. And so we, do, we don't have to be taken or to be blamed for saying things because it, you cannot always <laughs> establish a direct link between what is said by a book and then what the writer thinks. Mm. So that said, mm. I wrote that poem in the context of Brexit. Mm. And I put my, I was imagining the reactions that some former, uh, formerly colonized people, some people formerly colonized by Britain might mm. feel. Mm. Uh, and then you can, if you can connect it there for even to the present situation of Cameroon, then you can, you can, you can see some of the connections in that I'm trying to draw. But of course, some people can also try to even bring a feminist twist to it and read it from a feminist perspective. And actually, uh, with, with regard to real divorce and perhaps seeing divorce as being liberatory. So, mm -hmm. so uh, this is just to tell you that I wrote the, the poem and not the interpretation. So it can be interpreted as many in many ways as possible. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to contextualize that I actually wrote that poem <laughs> at the, at the <laughs> time Brexit. of Brexit. Can I just yeah. appreciate what you said? It reminded me of one of my, my professors who is of late, uh, Professor Teju Molan, Mola Olani. And um, I was taking his class at UW-Madison and we were reading about Fela Kuti. And I remember everybody was okay. doing all these interpretations of Fela's songs. Like, what was he thinking? What was he? And 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 <laughs> Professor Olani said, I don't think he was thinking all of that. He was <laughs> probably just smoking Igbo and <laughs> being with women and you know, just said, let me write this song. And you guys are here interpreting all these mm -hmm. things. So, <laughs> so you're quite right that, you know, audiences interpret things as they want. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you two last questions. Uh, one is, uh, what, ha what, what has been an effective tool for you as you go into writing? You know, when I listen to people like Shimamanda and um, Wole Shoinka, you know, they say how they have to go to a particular place, you know, be in a, in a quiet space so that they can be inspired and finish their work. What helps you in your writing process? Ah, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. Uh, that's, that, that one is quite, I think because uh, I still combine writing, I'm, I've not yet gone full time into writing. Mm -hmm. That might happen one day, who knows? But for now, uh, all of my writing, as you know, I started writing in secondary school and up to now I've been, I've, got, I've always combined writing with many, many, many other things, mm -hmm. as, which means that I don't have the luxury of actually going off and <laughs> going away to think. Mm -hmm. To use an expression from one of the, the scholars in my field of uh, great scholars in my field of uh, research, uh, uh, Scott Slovy, who, who has written a book known as Going Away to Think, and it's about like uh, uh, the environmental crisis and what and the role of reflection on that. Mm -hmm. But to come back to our question, yes, for me, I think I, I've not had the privilege and the luxury yet of having dedicated time only to writing or having a writing residency, which is a good one. I've gone to a writing residency uh, about two. Yeah, I think two, but always like quite brief because one was the Ken Price writing retreat in Rwanda mm -hmm. that I attended in 2018. Then another one I attended when I was a, a master's student at the University of St. Andrews in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I went with, uh, with some uh, the teachers in the French department. I think that's as far as I can remember having had some little time to write and always, only to write and talk only about writing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. every other thing I do as a writer, I always squeeze a little bit of time out of many other things that I'm doing. I'm trying to do it. And then again, to, to, go, to, to, to to finish here on this uh, question because I guess maybe you see have another one is that uh, for me and I guess for many writers too uh, the muse the muse 
uh, doesn't ask your permission to come. So the muse can come at any time. So, so, so when the muse comes, you can either take what the muse has brought and put it down either in complete form or in a sketchy form with plans to ever finish it at some point, or you might never finish. To use a, a metaphor that I've used, like writers are like guinea pigs, because guinea pigs are animals, I used to read them, and I noticed that on the same day that a guinea pig gives birth, it conceives that same day. So the same day a guinea pig <laughs> Gets, gives birth, it conceives that same day. And I used to say writers are like guinea pigs. Uh, is that every time they are giving birth, there is also already some conception, but it depends if that will ever re come into being a birth or not. Mm. And so yeah. you can always find that writers usually die and leave unfinished manuscripts. Yeah, so interesting. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, yeah. The last question is, sorry, my second to the last question is, um, you talk about being from Bessa and the Bessa language. And for those who have no clue where that is. Where is Mbessa in Cameroon? Oh, great. That's a beautiful question. If at least this like this like my super nice question today, because <laughs> there is no nothing I'm so happy about that to talk about Mbessa, because I think that's that's my assignment on earth to talk about Mbessa. Yes. I wrote a book called Do You Know Mbessa? So Mbessa is a kingdom, a fundum, we, when we say fundum in the grass fields of Cameroon, and when we say grass fields of Cameroon, we're talking about the northwest region, the west region, uh, predominantly Bamiliki, and also parts of the southwest, that is Libyan. These are people called in Cameroon the grass fielders or the grass fields or the grasslands. So Mbessa is one of the hundreds of kingdoms in the grass fields of Cameroon, and we are located in Boyo Division uh, in the northwest region. Mm -hmm. And it's a kingdom of about 30,000 people. Uh, and we have this powerful king over us, our father, the Fon of Mbessa, for His Royal Highness Fon Gibe Njong III. And uh, we speak the Mbessa language, also called Iteng Mbessa. And we have neighbors like Kom, uh, which is a mighty tribe, a very big yes. tribe. And then we have Oku, uh, which is also quite yes, more popular. quite known here. And then uh, Din in Noni and Ake, and these are some of our, our neighbors. So that's where I come from. And, that's our language, and I'm also the coordinator of the Mbasa language, uh, language committee, yeah. Okay, so that's wonderful. why I said this is like my best question. In <laughs> we love to talk about where we come from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, my very last question is, um, how can people keep up with you? Where should they go to keep up with your work and everything you're doing? Mm, um, I would say most of my books are available online. Uh, only a few of my books are not available online, but for those ones which are not available, like for example, Do You Know Mbessa is not uh, available online. I'm still planning a revised edition that when it is published, I will make sure it is on uh, on Amazon. Uh, so a few of, very few of my books are not on Amazon, but any of my books like Andolo is on Amazon and the other children's books like uh, Little Gabriel Starts to Read is on Amazon. Then there is a, quite another very exciting book I'm waiting for that will be coming out this year, I do hope, uh, known as What the Moon Cooks. So, uh, and that one, it will be released in the US. And then there are other books by me, like my poetry collections that you mentioned, they are all found on Amazon. They can be purchased online and also from their publishers like uh, Spears Book, Spears Books in the US or Langa uh, Publishing or, uh, for example, Vita Books in Kenya or uh, Les Editions Akumamba in Yaoundé and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been such a rich conversation. I'm so grateful you made the time. Um, so listeners, go and check out his books on Amazon or viewers. And you can also follow, he mentioned his YouTube channel. So check out his YouTube channel. Thank you yeah. so much, Samala. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Linda. And I'm also reachable on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. All right. So he's on all social media platforms. <laughs>